This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. On this week's PreserveCast, we're heading back 250 years to the mid-18th century to talk to Ed Schultz, master farmer of Colonial Williamsburg. We're covering a lot of ground on this episode, rich, fertile ground, and we'll take a closer look at what it takes to learn this style of farming and what lessons it holds for the future of sustainable agriculture. We'll also talk with Ed about his work with ALFAM, an association for living historians, and what that organization does for the field of heritage preservation. All that and much more on this week's PreserveCast. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast. Today, we're really excited to be able to sit down with Ed Schultz, who is a master farmer at Colonial Williamsburg, a place many of us are familiar with, but we're going to get to understand a little different side of it and get to know one of the faces and the minds behind some of the really cool things that happen there. Um, And we're also going to be talking about his involvement in ALFAM, and we'll learn about what ALFAM is. If you don't know, we've had some members private previously rather here on preserve cast um talking about that um but ed it's it's uh, fun to have you here coming to us i can assure you people can't see him but he's not in the field right now not literally in the field he's in an office um but uh where did you grow up and how does one become a master colonial farmer in the 21st century okay well i grew up in michigan uh in the southeastern part just above ohio and I grew up on a 40-acre farm, but we didn't farm it. We leased out our land, but we did farm in a way. Um, there was a recession in the 1970s. That kind of tells you how old I was. And I'm 60 now. And uh, Dad was a businessman, and uh, he did commercial roofing, and the whole thing almost collapsed. So to save money... We or to make money, what we did is we grew a huge garden and we grew livestock. And uh, that was just part of of life growing up. And and it really made me who I am. I'm still doing that at home. And this work has been an extension of it Um, for to get to be master farmer here. For me, it was a road. To here, I had 10 years uh, experience at different living history farms, uh, which is, and then I got here, and for the last 20 years, I've been here. So to become a master farmer, you start as an apprentice, and the apprentice program is five levels or five years, and there, there are hand skills and intellectual knowledge as well. You work your way through those five years. And then you become a journeyman, okay? And a journeyman is a fully qualified farmer or silversmith or, you know, weaver or whatever the trade is. Uh, From there, the master of the the shop, you know, in general, is the person who's in charge of the shop. And they are usually the senior person and the most knowledgeable. So this has been a a long process for me because I had previous farm experience. So, and actually we have our, an apprentice right now as well. So that's how it works at Colonial Williamsburg. And we'll talk a little bit about maybe historically how it worked, but how did you go from a young kid growing a vegetable garden and livestock in Michigan to, I know there was 10 years of doing other sites, but there must've been, did you go to school? Did you kind of bounce around, think you were going to do something else and then got into this? How did you go from that kid that we talked about? So we know the process of becoming master farmer, but I I think people might be curious. It's always interesting to know people's paths. Sure. Okay. So uh, I would say a kid on that 40 acre farm and I was an extremely shy kid um, and did a lot of thinking, a lot of time by myself and realized that all I wanted to do is be a farmer, you know, like a 20th century, when it's still the 20th century then. And it was a sudden realization that if I didn't have 500 acres, if I wasn't one of the sons or daughters of a farmer, there's no way. And I, I was devastated. So I 
I thought, well, I'll go to school. Uh, well, first I went in the army because I'm good at work. I became a paratrooper and was a combat engineer, which is all about work to support the infantry. And that gave me a little more time, thinking time, and it certainly got me out of that shyness part. They're pretty good at that. So after that, uh, I went to college, and so I got a history degree because that was my love. I loved history. So you see where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. You got history. You got this farming thing that's inside me, right? And then I did an internship at a place called Home Place 1850, which at the time, this is a 1990, was one of the most progressive living history farms in the country. And where is that located? Uh, in Kentucky. It's okay. uh, in a national recreation area called Land Between the Lakes. And uh, during that time, I was a ranger up on a, a trail ranger on a mountain. And uh, like I said, you know, I was in the Army, so I'm good at carrying a pack and walking. And uh, I went to this internship, and we farmed in the mid-19th century. And I came back, and that was all I wanted to do with my life. It, it, fi it was finally there. Um, you combine history and farming. And that's it. So um, uh, eventually I, I started working on some living history farms. And then I went to graduate school and got a master's in outdoor museum management. So I could be a site manager for one of these things. And it was off. And uh, this is the 32nd year in it. And I still love it. So, well, that's, I think that's actually really fascinating. And I think it's interesting too, from maybe going back to where you're talking about how Colonial Williamsburg handles the process, no matter what trade you're in of going from apprentice to master. Historically, if we're going back just to farming in the 18th century, like I know that the, the, the trade process and the apprenticeship process was, was standardized and there was a process for it for what we would think of as trades, blacksmithing and silversmithing and things like that. Right. Was there an apprenticeship process for farming or was it a little different? That's really good point, Nick. It was lifelong. Right. Um, if you were a son, uh, you were, or, or, a, or an enslaved person, a male or female enslaved person, you were brought up farming. That, that was what you did. And so you were with somebody else and you learned intuitively. Now, certainly, it was, you know, somebody would say, well, oh, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. But it's it becomes like inside you. And I learned that a long time ago as that shy kid. If you I learned the knack that they had of watching somebody do something and then replicating it on my own. And that's what these kids were doing. And while they go along, there's so much work to do, Nick. And I taught me, my sons this too, is that you've got to get this work done. So you are in charge of your own education. You're asking your father or the person next to you, how do you do that? What were you just doing? You're actually, the initiative is upon you rather than someone who instructs, you know, and then the receiver of the information. So the onus is actually on the person. Um, and to become a good farmer, it, it is always lifetime with farming. It's never done. And that's one of the things I love about it. Right. And I mean, particularly as, you know, the climate is all over the place. I mean, you don't, you don't have to be a climate scientist to figure out that this year has been weird. We were just talking oh. about how you were in shirt sleeves yesterday and, I'm recording here in Maryland, and for the first time ever, I think, we haven't really even received a trace of snow this winter at all. Um, so, I mean, and, and the reason I mention that is that in terms of learning and be, being a lifetime learner, you've got to figure out how to adapt to that. I mean, I heard that, I think I read yesterday that they've never seen this much tree pollen in the air in February because yeah. they're already, you know, so and, and how that impacts the cycle of growth and how you're planning out your year probably is something that you're just learning along with sort of as the cycles change and as we adapt to the, all of this same way that I'm sure that they would have in the 18th century, perhaps not with not the same challenges, but others. Well, you're always adapting to the environment. That's the 
uh, that's a fact of, of farming. Uh, Ned, climate change is real. I'm living it here. The farming I do here at Colonial Williamsburg and at home as well. Um, this, I'm cutting tobacco earlier. We keep a farm book and have for uh, over 25 years. And the time that we're cutting tobacco is going back and back and back. The time we plant is all the way into June, 20 plus years ago. Now it's earlier and earlier in May. And therefore, I'm cutting it earlier and early. It's hotter. Uh, things are changing without a doubt. Yeah. And that's got to impact the work. I'm curious, when you got to Colonial Williamsburg, so you've been there, you said, I think, 30 years. What was the status of the sort of the farming program when you got there? How has it changed over time? What have you added? What have you removed? And maybe give people a sense for when we're talking about the Colonial Williamsburg farming program, what does that entail? Is that the gardens that you would see if you're at a historic home? Or is that, you know, what is, how is it that you define farming? Because I know it's the same thing with some of the other trades. Um, you know, there's different different pieces of it. Uh, good, really good questions. We've had over the last 30 years of historic farming, actually it's 40. Um, we've had various sites, various manifestations of sites. We've had Carter's Grove. We had a, a, a near the windmill in the historic area in the town. We've had a farm called Great Hopes Plantation. And now we have a new site called, uh, we call it the Ewing Field. And we're back with the windmill again. So we've uh, gone, we've had all kinds of, this is the third manifestation at that I've been at in CW. This is a really interesting one. Um, this is uh, real farming, but on an extremely smaller plot. Okay. And what this does is allow us to, to look at the full 18th century. Not like a Lumi history farm is like a distinct, time period like 1840 to 50. What we can do is look at the most uh, earliest means, which is Ho Hill agriculture, all the way to the agricultural revolution that's happening in the 18th century in coordination with wheat, like new advanced plows. And this site is allows us to do something called experimental history uh, or experimental archaeology is another name for it where we can actually test the efficiency of the plows through various machines. And this is a whole new area that we've never done before in the 40-year history of uh, farming here at CW. So and what, what allows you to do it in this space versus others, or was it a conscious decision to go down this road? It was both. Um, it was, it's, it's not a farm, okay? So when we come to this site, uh, you shouldn't expect like, you know, chickens and cows and barns and stuff like that. It's a it's a site of experimentation. So I learned more about this, especially from Klaus Krop, who was one of your your uh, speakers on on another podcast. Uh, and it really inspired me to pursue this more closely. Um, why was it good or why was it bad? You know, the it, the technology of it. This is the first opportunity. It's, it's a demonstration area that we can actually test those theories. And does it have, I'm curious, so you, a lot of times people, it's sort of like archaeology, there's sort of the so what, right? Like where it's like, okay, so you found a pipe stem, so what? What does that tell us? And why does that matter today? And why should we spend so much money finding those things? And I'm curious, given the conversation we had sort of about a changing climate, and the conversation we're having about experimental um, and Klaus's work. If people go back to that episode, we could put a link in the show notes to it where we talked about sort of this idea where he's growing wheat and flax and different things across the world and seeing how they how they work out. I did try and grow flax in my backyard. I, 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 I succeeded. I was very proud of myself. But, I heard about that. <laughs> but how does does this have an impact? Is there potential for impact in the sustainable agricultural practices of the 21st century? Are people looking to Williamsburg and is there information and research being shared that could help inform where we're headed as a, as sort of, you know, really we're like civilization level when we're talking about agriculture. Does it, could it help inform that kind of thing? 
It it can. Um, our motto here at Colonial Williamsburg is that the future may learn from the past. Okay, so we're also partnering uh, with a group called Tillers International, um, which does that. They uh, experiment with technology and then apply it to the developing world, changing people's lives, making it easier for them to grow food. Uh, we're going to link into that. So how does it work with, with you know, these plows, say James Small's plow from the 1790s? The efficiency or inefficiency of that technology can be known and then applied to implements in the developing world. Or, you know, Nick, if you think about it, it could be in the developed world too. You see uh, small farmers that are growing vegetables and things like that, that could be horsepower or ox power. I was actually just going to ask that question because I know some folks who have kind of moved back towards that just because the cost of maintaining a, you know, a diesel powered $300,000 tractor is just not realistic for vegetable crops or, you know, a, a CSA that actually a horse, it sounds so to some audiences, certainly not to you, it sounds silly, but that there's actually a real sustainability associated with that. And I feel like that's a place where Colonial Williamsburg and these other sites now really have something to add to the conversation because we were so focused on mechanizing everything that we didn't stop to think if we should. <laughs> Yeah, we're not, uh, they weren't farming to make the pavement on the combine. You know, they were they were farming to make money, of course. Uh, something I want to know, though, about the 18th century is was not sustainable. It was, a, it was a time of agricultural degradation, and it was in the pursuit of tobacco, which depletes the soil, and they do it over and over and over. Towards the end of the 18th century, innovation comes in because disaster has come upon them. There's no choice. You either go to Kentucky or Ohio or you adapt new technology. So this is a, a pattern. And, you know, uh, horse and ox produce manure, compost manure that feeds the plant. So in the right right spot in small like market gardeners this is an alternative here i'm preserving these skills i'm one of the few historic sites that cultivates with a single horse i know that i probably cultivated 100 miles with a horse i can do that in my sleep that's the kind of thing that you could do between strawberry patch or you know organic sweet corn or green beans or stuff something like that and like I said, the horse is sustainable. He produces manure, which can feed the crop. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, it's absolutely. Not, it's yeah. not a dead end technology. Yeah, that you can't even repair sometimes. <laughs> oh, but you got to keep him alive. Or you do. He you do. He's dead. <laughs> Let's take a quick break. Come back. Talk about what you're growing in the season ahead. What people can expect to see there, and you know, maybe some things that if people want to try their hand at this in their own backyards, what you would recommend. Um, and we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. Historic preservation can't happen without skilled tradespeople to perform the work. And there's a critical need right now for those tradespeople. The Campaign for Historic Trades, powered by Preservation Maryland, is working to meet that need by strengthening apprenticeship opportunities within historic trades. In partnership with the National Park Service's Historic Preservation Training Center and Conservation Legacy, the campaign is currently recruiting for NPS Traditional Trades Apprenticeship Program, or TTAP. TTAP is an intensive 20-week apprenticeship that provides young adults the chance to learn historic trade skills while working on America's most iconic historic sites. Multiple positions are open for the 2022 season at national parks across the country. Visit historictrades.org for more information on TTAP and how to apply today. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast. Excited today to be talking with Ed Schultz, a master farmer at Colonial Williamsburg. And we've been talking about how he got into this line of work, what, what they do at Williamsburg, and, and how that has transitioned over the past 30 to 40 years. 
um, and the implications of their work on sustainability in the modern world and how they're engaging with other um, voices around that. Um, I'm curious, you know, the sort of the nuts and bolts of this, what are you actually um, planning on growing in the year ahead? And what is your um, agricultural year look like? Like, where are you in that? I mean, historically, obviously, we were in a time when all the other tasks were being done around the farm. What does that mean for a living history farmer? What do you what does your year look like? And when when will you start planting? Well, our main crops are tobacco, corn, and wheat. Uh, those are sus- sustaining crops. Uh, the corn is, of course, for grits, hominy, and cornmeal, you know, cornbread. And that is your lifeblood. And ironically, it is today, too. We just don't see corn uh, in our diet. Did you eat your grits this morning, Nick? I did not, although sometimes I do. Yeah, some, I'm a sometimes grit guy, too, growing up in Michigan. Um, but, you know, that sustained them. So how do you make money? you got to make money. This is a real international economy here on the edge of Virginia here with the Atlantic Ocean. and We're getting ships full of goods. We make money through tobacco. And that gives us income, and we buy stuff just like today. Um, like I was saying, when the tobacco, and it's not tobacco, it's man growing over and over and over, depleting the soil, we switch to wheat and technology blooms. But we also grow other experimental crops like flax. When the Revolutionary War comes, we're in bad straits. All the imports are gone. You know, uh, this is wartime. Um, and they have to grow basically their own clothes, starting the seed. They've never done it before. We preserve those skills. Yeah, I know that feeling when I tried to grow my flax. That was that was something else. It was a, it's a it was a seed crop really because I only got so many of them. So it was sort of like, okay, can I grow enough so that next year I have enough to actually do something with? Yeah, um, but it was it was eye opening. It's fun to try that, which is sort of why I was actually leading us down that path too, um, which we'll talk about what people perhaps could do in their own backyards. But so you've got some experimentals like flax. What else would you be experimenting with this year? Well, you might be interested in this uh, cotton as well as a fiber crop. Uh, in relation to the war, you have to grow cotton. Um, the actual variety of our period is gone. It's it's gone. Um, and so what we're trying to do is cross different varieties. And the parameter that we're going for is a smooth black seed, which is all we get from the written record. We grow the smooth black seed type. And the reason why is there's no cotton gin. Right. The machine to separate the lint from the seed. So right. the smooth seed is easier. So we're crossing different varieties. And this is a 20, 30-year project, trying to work our way back to a smooth smooth seed, black seeded cotton. That's kind of the little things that people don't usually see, but as we expect, as we expand into the experimental archaeology mode, we're sharing that. And the guests love this stuff. Uh, Let me give you another example with a pumpkin. Uh, Thomas Jefferson loved this thing called a cheese pumpkin, or not a cheese pumpkin, uh, sweet potato pumpkin. He said it tasted like sweet potatoes, and his enslaved people thought so too. So he started growing different varieties of pumpkins, even one called a sweet potato pumpkin. Okay. So I think it tastes just like sweet potato. My wife made a bisque out of it. It's like liquid sweet potato. But you give it to other people, my foodie test group, which were friends, colleagues, chefs, and the majority say yes, it tastes like sweet potato. This is experimental archaeology through our bellies, through our taste buds in our bellies. We have all kinds of cool stuff like this going on that people don't really see, but we share when they come visit us. And so if people are coming to visit, when would they see you start putting things in the ground? And what's um, the what's the cycle look like? So right right now, probably in one week, time or so we're going to start plowing okay uh, which is is my favorite thing uh we use single horse uh we're going to also expand into oxen uh we we're waiting for the weather the weather's the soil's got to dry out um after that we're planting the corn in the middle of april by april 15th and because of climate 
uh, we're planning it earlier and earlier towards the first of April, one year even late March. Um, after that, tobacco is is pitched. That's what we call transplanting into hills about May 1st. Uh, the wheat is already planted. Um, then we go with cotton after that, and then pumpkins and other things. Um, by June 15th, it's on. And uh, especially with tobacco, there's so many different things you got to do to grow a good tobacco crop. It's... Uh, it's hard, but it's fun. Everybody complains about it. But look, if you're the guy making the money, uh, you don't mind at all. Right. Yeah. We we meet a lot of people that come see us. And uh, I mean, thousands of people a year. And some, you know, some more and more, they're less. There's less people that have an agricultural background. And they look at that tobacco and uh, there's some that hate it. But I just always say, boy, you loved it at Christmas when <laughs> mom and dad bought you Christmas presents, didn't you? And uh, here's, a, here's this is kind of interesting. Some of them, yeah, it says, yeah, I, I went to college on tobacco money, so I didn't have to grow tobacco. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. See, the old ways are not so far apart. Yeah. They're not so far from us. No, no. And that's that's actually a good segue to kind of talk about Alfam. Um which is sort of a, an organization dedicated in, in many ways to sustaining those and providing sort of a, a community for people who do this kind of work. So it's the Association for Living History, Farm, and Agricultural Museums. Um, how, how engaged are you in that? And what all does that bring together for people who are listening and perhaps do that kind of work and aren't familiar with it or might, might be interested in getting engaged? Um, what, what kind of... Um, kind of collaboration comes together under under alfam well i've been engaged with them since 1988 it was my entry point into the living history field uh which of course alfam can be a lot of different expressions living history is a broad umbrella that could be uh you know an actor interpreter that portrays george washington or a farmer like myself um it was my way in. It's how I learned about living history in 1988. And then that led to an internship and on. So anybody interested in getting a living history, this is the route. You get in there, you go to conferences, you meet people, you understand it, and it's on. Um, right. So I've been a, a board member. I was uh, chair of what's called the Farm Professional Interest Group for 10 years and really got farming back into Alfam. Uh, Alfam, remember, is about living history. It's agriculture is one part. Um, right now, I'm into on a committee called the Skills Training and Preservation uh, Committee, which is like the action arm of the mission statement, which is to preserve and share uh, practical skills now, that just doesn't mean like how to make a basket or how to plow with a mule. Those are intellectual skills, too. And that's our, our niche in the museum world, skills oriented. When you walk away from a conference or a workshop, you're going to take something you can use. It's more, to, more than, a, huh, that's interesting. It's more than that. It's it's tangible. We actually we call it intangible culture. It's the knowledge that you can't see, but is there. And that's going the way of the dinosaur, this stuff. And so I believe there's two for me in agriculture, there's two fields. One is the lowercase F, and that's the one I'm working in plowing here at Colonial Williamsburg. And then the other one is the capital L. F, the field of living history. And I feel beholden, I feel it is my duty to share this with as many people as possible. And that I can do through Alfan. Well, it's a it's a great pitch. And I, if you're listening and you're engaged in any way um, in, in the world of living history, um, obviously, we'll have a link in the show notes so that you can jump on there learn more about them, get engaged. Um, we've had several 
previous guests on who are associated with them and doing really cool work with them in a wide variety of different trades um, and aspects of living history. Um, and we encourage people to go and learn more about them. Um, we always ask people what they're working on and then what's their favorite historic place or site. Um, and we'll, we'll give you a pass. You don't have to say Williamsburg, even though you work there, but, oh, okay. um, what are you, uh, what are you working on right now? When you, when you, when you end this conversation, what are you headed back to as the ma- a master farmer at Colonial Williamsburg? Well, uh, we've got, um, fruit trees to prune. Um, okay. And the rain stopped, so we're going to uh, go out there and uh, prune fruit trees. And uh, my new apprentice, I'm teaching him how to do it. It's an acquired skill. Um, I'm pretty good at it, but like I said, I'll be learning for the rest of my life how yeah. to do it. Well, that's a good good reminder of a previous episode that we just released about a guy down in um, the Carolinas who has found over a thousand different varieties of heirloom apple trees. Um, in lost orchards, um, wow! And is, is working to save them, sort we, of from extinction. We might have some of his trees. You probably yeah. do. Yeah, he's he's like a modern day Johnny Appleseed. So you're trimming fruit trees, and then what's that favorite place? I think it's Howl Living History Farm in, okay. up in uh, Western New Jersey. Um, what I love about them, especially, is it's real work, Nick. This is no playing around, and. Uh, when you go there, you're seeing their time period, which is the latter part of the, uh, or rather the early part of the 20th century. You're seeing it in action. This is the real thing happening on a, a very close scale to the, what it actually was. Um, it's immersive. Um, there's not a separation between the visitor and them. You're as I describe it, you're in it. Uh, that's what I love about how living history form. Well, we'll have to get them on a, an upcoming episode of Preserve Cast. You're making a making a good case to go to Williamsburg and Howell and all these other cool places. So Thanks. Um, it's been a pleasure talking with you. So interesting to get to sit down with someone like yourself um, and uh, wish you all the best in the field in the next year. Thank you so much, Nick. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening and keep on preserving.